How's everybody doing today? Good, good. We're going to jump right into our study today. We've been working through the book of Genesis. We've gone through the study of Abraham, Isaac, and now we are looking at the life of Jacob. I need to tell you on the front end that we are going to take a big chunk today, and uh, we're going to read and just make a few comments as we go. We don't typically do this, but uh, there was just no way to break up the story today. So if you survive this, you're, you're golden, So just, just so you know that. So if you've been following or you haven't been following, you'll remember that Jacob had fled his homeland and his family because he had deceived his brother and his father. And uh, his brother is so angry that his brother wanted to kill him. So Jacob, in our story, goes 500 miles to the north to his uncle Laban's house. And while he's there, uh, he meets Rachel and he works seven years in order to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel. And you'll recall that it's on the wedding night that Laban switches the daughters. So the next morning, Jacob wakes up and he realizes that he's married to Leah. Jacob had deceived his family and is now being deceived to the point where he's been deceived into marrying the wrong girl. So he gets to marry Rachel also, but he has to work another seven years for her. He gets her up front, but then then he has to work another seven years. He wanted to marry one woman, but he winds up being married to four women, and we talked about that. Now, to his credit, He endures what has happened. He endures it, and to his credit, his desire is to provide for his family. He wants to do the right thing. So our story picks up, and I want you to write down that Jacob is about 90 years old, and they were saying in those days that 90 was the new 40, (laughs) somewhere in the Bible. So he has these four wives. He has 12 children that we know of so far. Last week, we looked at some of the dysfunction in his family, but today we're gonna look at some signs of maturity as uh, he's continuing on, as as God is leading him. So you wanna write down that Jacob has been working in Laban's house now for 14 years. So it's been quite, quite a time. So we're gonna jump into our story. We're gonna pick it up right where we left off last week, which is in verse 25 is where we pick it up this week as we consider some signs of maturity. Well, verse 25, it says, now it came about when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, that's the father-in-law, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. His own country is going to be the land of Israel. We would call it the promised land. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me depart for you yourself know my service which I have rendered to you. But Laban said to him, if now it pleases you, stay with me. I have, my Bible says, divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. One of the things that we're going to notice in this is that a sign of maturity will be, and you wanna write this down, is when unbelievers recognize God's hand in my life. They look on and they say, something is going on in your life. You wanna keep in mind that Laban is an unbeliever. There in your outline, I put verse 27. Laban says, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. When, when he says the Lord, The word that he uses there is the Hebrew word we would say Yahweh. It's a very specific God. It's not his God, but it's the God of Jacob. And so it's a sign of maturity when unbelievers see something that God is doing in your life. Now, the ancient understanding of this verse, because some of your Bibles will say, Laban says, I've seen by experience, something like that. How many of your Bibles say something like that? The, the word is actually divination. The ancient, under, the ancient understanding of this verse, a thousand years before Jesus was even born, is that Laban would go to his gods, which we would see, and it's his gods through divination revealed that he's being blessed because of the God of Jacob. And we'll see that as, as we go. So Jacob says, or, or Laban says, you know, I, I've been blessed by you. It's interesting, and you wanna keep in mind, he doesn't say, I want you to stay because I love you. I want you to stay because I, I love my daughters. I love my grandkids. He says, I want you to stay because it's good for business. And, and you wanna keep that in mind as we go. Well, verse 28, it says, so he continued uh, 
Name your wages and I will give it. But he said to him, you yourself know how I have served you and how your cattle have fared with me. For you've had little before I came and it has increased to a multitude. And underline, the Lord blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household? So Jacob says, I, I need to start taking care of my own family. You know, I have, I have this family, I have these 12 kids, I need to do something. So we'll talk about that. One of the things we wanna notice is that it's a sign of maturity when God gets the credit for what's going on. Jacob says, the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. Jacob says, not me, the Lord is blessing. He gives God all the credit. That's a sign of maturity. Verse 31, so he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you only do this one thing for me, I will again pasture and keep your flock. Laban will negotiate with his son-in-law who needs to earn a living to take care of Laban's two daughters and all of his grandkids. We're going to see as we get into this that Laban loves money above all else and he will gladly take food out of his daughter's and his grandchildren's mouth if it prospers him, if it benefits him. So you wanna keep that in mind as we go. Verse 32, uh, Jacob says, let me pass through your entire flock today removing there from every speckled and spotted sheep and every black one among the lambs and the spotted and the speckled among the goats and such shall be my wages. So he says, you know, the, 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 the sheep that are all white are more valuable, so here's what I'll do. I'll take all the ones that you don't want that you consider not valuable and I'll take those and, uh, and that's how I'll start my business. Now, Laban will take the deal because he sees the odds stacked against Jacob. So we'll see that as we go. Well, verse 33. So my honesty, Jacob continues, will answer me, will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and the black ones among the lambs, if found with me, will be considered stolen. So he says, I'll, I'll, I'll watch your flocks. I'm just gonna start my company with the stuff that, that you don't want. Here's where the plot thickens, verse 34. Laban said, good, let it be according to your word. So he, and this is Laban, you wanna keep in mind, Laban removed on that day the stripe, the spotted, the male goats, and all the speckled, the spotted, the female goats, everyone with white in it, and all the black ones among the sheep, and he gave them into the care of his sons, Laban's sons. And he, Laban, put a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. In case we miss it, the Amplified Bible says it like this there in your outline. But that same day, Laban removed the he goats that were streaked, the spot, and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted with everyone that had white on it and every black lamb and put them in charge of his sons. So before Jacob can go through and, and get the sheep that were agreed upon, Laban goes through and removes them. Once again, Jacob, uh, Laban deceives Jacob, and Jacob wants to do this just so he can feed Laban's two daughters and the 12 grandkids. But Laban will go ahead and, and remove those. Laban will deceive Jacob in this. Jacob will not respond. But the last line of verse 36, it says, Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. So you wanna write down, it's a sign of maturity when I trust God, not my circumstances. He's walked with God long enough to know that God's going to be the one who's going to bless him, so he's not going to make this an issue. Verse 37, now verse 37, I'm gonna read a paragraph here. It's kind of a tongue twister, but uh, we'll, we'll We'll get through it, verse 37. Then Jacob took the fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled, you wanna underline the word white, stripes in them, exposing the white. Does your Bible say something like exposing the white? Okay, uh, which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled in front of the flocks in the gutters, even in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink. And they mated when they came to drink. 
So the flocks mated by the rods. The flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. Jacob separated the lambs, and he made the flocks face towards the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban, and he put his own herds apart. And he did not put them with Laban's flock. Moreover, Whenever the stronger of the flock were mating, Jacob would place the rods in the sight of the flock in the gutters so that they might mate by the rods. But when the, when the flock was feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And the man became exceedingly, you want to underline that word exceedingly, have your Bible says it, prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Now, how many of you have used this method of mating? <laughs> so, so the question is, what's really going on here? Well, a couple of things. First of all, some suggest that there's a word play going on here. Uh, there in your outline, it says he made white stripes. The word for white in Hebrew is the word Laban. Does everybody see that? Just Laban. So he made white, uh, Laban white stripes on them by peeling the bark and underlying exposing the white or exposing Laban, inner wood and branches. So some suggest that there's a word play here, exposing Laban. That's just one of those things that's interesting. I, I wouldn't build theology on it, but, it, but it's interesting. But what is happening here, and you want to write this down, is that God is fulfilling his promise in unusual ways. You see, God had already promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I will bless those who bless you, there in your outline, and whoever curses you, I will curse. So here, Laban has been cursing Jacob. Now, Laban finds himself being cursed but God is blessing Jacob, just doing it in very unusual ways. We're also going to find a little bit later on, you wanna write this down, that Jacob is following the Lord's leading. In the next chapter, we're going to find, it says in the breeding season, Jacob says, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw the male goats mating with the flocks were streaked, speckled, and spotted. The idea is God gave me this vision and said, I want you to do this. It doesn't make any sense, but God says, just do this. You never want to take the miracles of the Bible and try to figure them out logically or scientifically. Uh, when I was growing up in church, one of the things that was being taught is when Moses holds up, holds up his staff and splits the sea, uh, they would try to explain that to us scientifically. They say, you know, every once in a while, uh, there's this wind that blows across the sea and it blows so hard and it separates the sea and, and you can walk. How many of you have ever heard something like that? Okay. Well, well it's, that's not what happened. It's a miracle. You can't explain what God is doing uh, through science or, or logic. It's just a miracle. And that's the point here. In 2 Kings, there's this great story. Elijah is with the prophets, and uh, one of the prophets is swinging an axe, and the axe head flies off into the river. And so in order to get that back, uh, Elijah takes a stick, and he throws it into the water, and all of a sudden, the axe head floats. How many of you remember that story? So just so you know, there is no correlation between sticks hitting the water and ax heads floating. The idea, it's a miracle, you cannot explain it. So what God is doing here is unexplainable. And this is just something that God wants to do. And he's blessing Jacob. Now, how much is he blessing Jacob? Well, I put that verse there on your outline and it says, the man increaseth, and this is from a literal translation, increaseth, increaseth very exceedingly. And uh, what we miss in the English, because no English translation deals with this adequately, the word exceedingly there in Hebrew is mi'ad. Does everybody see that? Mi'ad. But the word in the original language, uh, they put the word mi'ad there two times. It's mi'ad, mi'ad. And the idea is it's exceedingly times exceedingly so that we would know that this is not something that can be explained other than God is supernaturally blessing Jacob. So you wanna write down that God is blessing supernaturally. So time is passing. And so far in our chapter, about six years have gone by. And so we pick it up in chapter 31, verses one through three. And it says, now Jacob, now remember, Jacob's being blessed supernaturally. Now, Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, 
Jacob has taken away all that was our father's and from what, from what belonged to our father, and he has made all this wealth. So the, you have the non-believers, they're looking on, they're not recognizing that this is God's blessing, they're just saying he's taking it from us. Jacob, verse two, saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as formerly. Then the Lord said to Jacob, you wanna underline that, we'll come back to that. Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So God says this, verse four, so Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to his flock in the field. He wants to get Rachel and Leah to the place where nobody else can hear the conversation. He doesn't feel safe at this point. So he wants to have a private conversation. Verse five, and said to them, I see that your father's attitude, that, that it's not friendly towards me as formerly, but the God of my father has been with me. He recognizes God's presence. You know that I've served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages 10 times. However, and I've underlined, God did not allow him to hurt me. So Laban gets out there, has, or Jacob gets out there, has this conversation, and uh, what, it's a sign of maturity, and I want you to write this down, when I realize whatever comes my way is father filtered. He says there, I put the verse on your outline, verse seven, your father has cheated me and changed my wages 10 times. However, God did not allow him to hurt me. Your dad did this, but God is the one who's been protecting us through this. Verse eight, if he spoke thus, the speckled shall be your wages. Then all the flocks brought forth speckled. And if he spoke thus, striped shall be your wages. Then all the flock brought forth striped. Thus God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. The idea is it wasn't the method, it was just something that God was doing. Verse 10, and it came about at the time when the flock were mating that I lifted up my eyes and I saw in a dream. And behold, the, the male goats which were mating were striped, speckled, and mottled. And the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the male goats and all the mating are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing. I've seen all that Laban has been doing to you. So the idea God says in this dream, I've seen what he's doing and I'm making it right. So he's still relating the dream to Rachel and Leah. Verse 13, God continues and he says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. God says it's now time to go. So now his wives speak, they chime in, verse 14. Rachel and Leah said to him, do we still have any portion or inheritance in our father's house? Are we not, are we not reckoned to him as foreigners? For he has sold us, underline sold us, and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. Surely all the wealth which God has taken away from our fathers belongs to us and to our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. You wanna underline that. So they give their opinion on the situation. And they say, we saw how God, or you served seven years for us each, and so the, what do we feel about it? We feel like our father sold us, like we're property. And, and not only that, but Laban, our father, took all the inheritance that we were supposed to have, and he spent it. We don't have any inheritance in the family. And so he treats us like foreigners. Now, a foreigner, that would be to say, he treats us like somebody you don't care about. You don't care about. So you wanna write this down. It's a sign of maturity when I know when to make a move. In this case, when it's time to go. So how do I know? I wanna point out four things very quickly. First of all, it begins with a God-given desire. You wanna write that down. In the last chapter, six years earlier, Jacob said, send me away that I may go to my own country. God began to stir in his heart six years ago, and it hasn't gone away, it's still stirring. 
He didn't leave impulsively, but, but it's still there. Another thing we notice, it's time to leave or, or to make a change when the situation sours. You wanna write that down. In verse two, it says, Jacob saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him as formerly. So the situation's going south, the door is shutting. Um, another thing that we notice, and you'll write this down, when I receive direction from God's word, when God speaks through his word. In verse three, it says, the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So here you have a situation souring, and you have God speaking. So, so how would this work out in our life? Now, he didn't have the Bible as we have. You know, we can look to God's word. Sometimes God speaks to us and gives us direction, but for the most part, we, we go straight to his word. His word illuminates. Somebody will say something like, the situation's souring. They'll say, you know, I'm in this work situation and uh, everybody makes fun of me because I'm a Christian. They hate the fact that I'm a Christian. They're constantly antagonistic. But I wonder, should I stay in that situation because I'm the only light in that situation? Well, maybe. Or somebody will say, you know, my relatives, they just hate the fact that I'm a Christian. They're always antagonistic to me. But, but should I stay in that situation because I'm the only light? Maybe, but never forget what Jesus taught there in your outline. Jesus said, do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they'll trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So sometimes when the situation is souring, God might be saying, don't just keep putting yourself out there they don't want it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you wanna go to, if the situation sours, then you go to, to God's word. Another thing that we notice, it's time to, to make a move when I have confirmation by wise counsel. In Proverbs it says, there, where there's no counsel, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. His wives, Rachel and Leah, are saying, it's really time to go, it's time to go. Um, I've learned in my life, and I'm continuing to learn, that any time I'm making a decision and Cheryl says, I don't know about that, it needs to be a no. <laughs> Guys, have you learned the same thing? <laughs> so every time, 100% of the time. So wise counsel, in that case it was his wife's. Well, verse 17. So Jacob arose and put his children and his wives upon camels. That if you have enough camels to put your whole family on, that means you're incredibly wealthy in, 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 that, in that environment. Verse 18, and he drove all his livestock and all his property which he had gathered, his acquired livestock which he had gathered in Padan Aram, and to, the, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Verse 19, when Laban had gone to shear his flock, then Rachel stole, you wanna underline, the household idols that were her father's. Jacob is going to wait until Laban is three days away. Rachel will then go into Laban's house and will steal the household gods. Now, if you read the ancient commentaries that were written more than a thousand years before Jesus was born, when they talk about this, they hold that Rachel goes into her dad's house, steals the gods, because she's concerned that those gods are going to tell him where they've gone. Uh, others suggest that she's still a non-believer. So e either way, she steals the gods. Verse 20, then Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, Aramean by not telling him where he was fleeing. So he fled with all that he had, and he arose and crossed the Euphrates River, and he set his face towards the hill country of Gilead. When it was told to Laban on the third day, just for perspective, that Jacob had fled, then he took his kinsmen, Laban's kinsmen, with him and pursued him a distance of seven days' journey, and he overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. So he finds out on the third day and then there's a seven day pursuit. So there's at least 10 days here. It could be more. It could be that he's three days away, three days to come back, a couple of days to pack up, and then to go. But at least 10 days. 
So he catches up, verse 24. God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream of the night and said to him, be careful, be careful that you do not speak to Jacob either good or bad. I've, I've always pictured this, that here's Laban and he's dreaming and, and all of a sudden in the midst of his dream, there's this flashing bright light and this finger comes out and just pokes him in the chest. And God says, be careful, you know, watch it, pal, that you don't speak about Jacob either good or bad. You just don't touch him. And, and so and I, I've always held that, that Jacob or, or that Laban would be terrified when this happens. I have in my notes that, that Laban experienced what could only be described as significant fluid loss when this happens. <laughs> but, but what I find interesting in this is that when God showed up to Jacob, Jacob became a believer. We saw that a few chapters ago. God shows up to Laban and he doesn't become a believer. Many times people say if God would just show up in their life, they would become a believer. Not always. Remember that thousands of people saw Jesus perform miracles. They didn't all become believers. So it's great when it happens, but for Laban, it's never going to happen. Verse 25, Laban caught up with Jacob. Now, Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsmen camped in the hill country of Gilead. Then Laban said to Jacob, what have you done by deceiving me and carrying away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why, have, why did you flee secretly and deceive me and did not tell me that I might have sent you away with joy and with songs and with timbrel and lyre, the stringed instruments, and did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Now you have acted foolishly. Laban, the deceiver who has been deceiving Jacob, is now deceived by Jacob, who is also a deceiver, and Laban is upset about the deception. Laban is the kind of person who has a moral code for everybody else but himself. You ever met anybody like that? You have a moral code for you and everybody else that just doesn't apply to them. He says, you carry them off like captives. Well, that's not really true. They can't stand their dad. And, and he says, you know, he doesn't see that he's evil. He doesn't see what he's done to the family. And he doesn't realize that his daughters really don't want him around the grandkids. Laban never repents. He never gets saved and he never changes. At the end of this chapter, we will never hear from Laban again. Verse 29, Laban says, it's in my power to do you harm, but the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful not to speak either good or bad to Jacob. Now, just notice it's the God of your father. It's not Laban's God because he doesn't believe in the God of, uh, of Isaac or Jacob's father. Verse 30, now you have indeed gone away because you long greatly for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? That's interesting because in the last chapter, Laban said, I've divined by my gods, we would say, that I've been blessed because of you and your God. And last night, your God appeared to me and says, watch it, pal. Make sure you don't say anything good or bad. Laban has seen God's blessing. He has heard God's warning, but he's going to stick with his gods. He's going to stick with his gods. He'll, he'll never become converted. Verse 31. Then Jacob replied to Laban, because I was afraid, for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force, and he would have. The one with whom you find your God shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what is yours among my belongings and take it for yourself. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent. Now, you, you wanna keep in mind, this is not a five-minute thing. Laban's gonna keep going, searching through everything. Uh, Jacob's gonna be watching. He gets hotter and hotter as this takes place. This is probably a couple of hours. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maids, but he did not find them. Then he went out to Leah's tent, when he went out of Leah's tent and he entered into 
Rachel's tent. Now, Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the camel's saddle, and she sat on them. They would take the camel's saddle, and they would use it as a seat in the tent. And Laban felt through all the tent, but he did not find them. Well, verse 35, she said to her father, let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is upon me. So, she, so he searched and did not find the household idols. Now, in case we miss it, from the Living Translation, it says it like this. She says, forgive me, forgive my not getting up, Father, Rachel explained, but I'm having my monthly period. So Laban did not find them. One commentator said, it's been 4,000 years and they're still using that same excuse. <laughs> Verse 36. <laughs> then Jacob became angry and contended with Laban. And Jacob said to Laban, what is my transgression? What is my sin that you've hotly pursued me? Jacob's not in the spirit at this point. Verse 37. Though you have felt through all my goods, what have you found? All of your household goods. Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us two. He's working himself up. Verse 38, these 20 years I have been with you. Your, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams from your flock. I couldn't feed my family with your, your stuff. That which was torn of beasts, I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. I've underlined, you required it of my hand. So it was always my fault, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. For thus, by day, for I was by day, he consumed me and frost by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I have been in your house, and I served you 14 years for your daughters and six years for your flock, and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the, you want to underline, the fear of Isaac had not been for me, surely you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the toil of my hands, and he rendered judgment last night. When it says the fear of Isaac, you want to keep in mind that Isaac, Abraham had a military of over 300 soldiers. Isaac was multiplied 100 times. So Isaac, and you recall as we went through the study, that uh, kings would say to Isaac, you're too powerful for us, you need to move away. So Isaac has a massive standing army. Laban realizes if anything happens to Jacob, Isaac is going to show up with the whole army and it's not going to be good. Laban doesn't dispute that, he just changes the subject. So verse 43, then Laban replied to Jacob, now don't miss this, the daughters are my daughters, the children are my children. The flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these, my daughters and to their children whom they have born? Laban is basically saying to Laban, uh, Laban is saying to Jacob, I see you as a slave. You don't have anything, it's all mine. Well, verse 44, so he says, so come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Laban says, let's make a covenant. Who does all the work? Verse 45. Then Jacob took a stone, underline that, and set it up as a pillar. Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. So they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there by the heap. Now Laban called it Jeger Shahadutha. Hopefully I pronounced that right. But Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, underline, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, it was named Galid. And Mitzpah, for he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. Um, both of them named it the heap of witness, just two different languages. Verse 50, here's the, the agreements, one-sided. Laban says, if you mistreat my daughters, or if you take wives besides my daughters, 
although no man is with us to see, God is a witness between you and me. Laban, underlined, said to Jacob, behold this heap and behold the pillar, underlined, which I have set between you and me. Jacob did all the work, Laban takes all the credit. Well, verse 52, this heap is a witness. The pillar is a witness that I will not pass by this heap to do you harm and you will not pass by this heap and this pillar for me or to me for harm. The God of Abraham and underline the God of Nahor and the God of their father judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac and you wanna underline that. Laban says, let's swear by the God of Nahor and his father. But Jacob swears by the fear of Isaac. Why is that? Well, we're told there in your outline in Joshua. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshiped other gods. They worshiped other gods. They were not the God of the Bible. Isaac says, you swear by whatever you want. I know who my God is. And so he doesn't swear by those gods. Verse 54, then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his kinsmen to the meal. And they ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. Verse 55, it ends with this. Early in the morning, Laban arose kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. And Laban departed and returned to this place, or returned to his place. Guess who didn't get kissed? Jacob. And the reason for that is some relationships just don't work out. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, it's not on your outline, he says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, Live at peace with all men. Sometimes, and in this case, it just wasn't possible. And Jacob had to let that relationship go. Does that make sense? There's so much in this. I know it was a lot today. Cheryl and I were talking about this, and uh, one of the things that she says, we talked about, it's a sign of maturity. And she was reminded about how when our kids were smaller, we would line them up along the wall, and we'd take a pencil, and we would draw their height. Do parents do that? and that we would see their growth. Some of these are great ways to evaluate our growth. Do we see the events in our lives as being father filtered, or do we immediately go to anger in response? Well, as we grow and we see God's working, that changes. So you wanna take some of those things and evaluate and see where you are. With that, we're gonna go ahead and close in prayer, and then we'll pick it up there next week. Let's pray. Father, as we wrap this up today, Lord, as we take this, I pray that as we leave here today, the parts that were speaking to us, jumping off the page at us, I pray, God, that you would illuminate, continue to illuminate, so that it wouldn't be just the story, but it would be something that you're speaking directly to us in our lives. And then, Father, I thank you for this congregation. I pray, God, that you keep us Until we meet again, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.